Today I want to look in 1 John, and we're going to look at the invitings of God and the enticings of the world, but in a very different way, uh, in, a, in a way where mostly I'm just focusing on the enticings, in the invitings, not the enticings. Ignore the enticings. Go for the invitation. All right. In 1 John, my challenge to you, if you have a regular devotional time, stick with your regular devo devotional time. Pastor Merrill last week was saying that uh, he wishes every single one of his parishioners would get into the Word every single day because getting into the Word every single day transforms uh, how we live. It will come out in your actions in your life. And so if you don't have a regular, this book, 1 John, it's short, it's poetic, it's playful, it's insightful, uh, and I just want to invite you to dip into a little bit of it uh, every day um, till you're done with it. Um, if you don't have a regular devotional, go for it. We're going to be looking at First John. And my hope is by the end of today, when you leave, you have a really clear concept of A, some places that this can apply directly into your life, and B, you know your state the state that you can walk in every single day. You know the abiding power of the Logos of God, the Word of life that dwells within you. And you have a, the complete idea, a very full idea of the relational connection that allows life to become easier in spots that might have been difficult before. It allows it to become easier. Before we start, I just want to prepare you. There's this idea of gleaning. There's actually a group called Gleaners, and they're still in existence where when a uh, truck spills over and the food falls out and they can't sell it anymore, people go glean that food, right? It comes from the scrip scriptural idea. But the fact is, if you were going to glean in the olden days, you had to be prepared. If you were going to get what you needed, you had to be prepared. So before we go look, uh, in looking into the scripture, I want to get us on the same page, get some definitions down so we're thinking of words the same ways, and then look at the whole context of John before we go look at the poem that we're going to consider. Is that okay? You on board with me? Okay, let's go for it. Let's do some definitions. By the way, those of you, again, uh, a couple of you giggle every time I mention these, uh, but mostly I get people saying, thank you. If you did not get us something to fill out, the bulletins are right back there. There's just little blanks to keep us focused. Grab a pencil in front of you. If yours isn't working, turn around and say, can I borrow your pencil? Um, and th this might be able to help us stay focused as we travel together down some definitions and stuff. The very first definition I want to remind us of is the definition of the word sin. And this is throughout the New Testament definition, okay? I'm not going to bother going to the Greek. I like saying the Greek when I get it right, and I'm sure some of you like hearing it because it tickles my intellect. Uh, I feel like I'm really smart. And today, instead of being smart, I just want to get to the brass tacks. Um, I don't want to be impressive. I just want us to get, get the idea in, if that, if that sounds fair. I'll impress you some other time with Greek. But the Greek meaning of this sin is literally missing the target, missing the ideal. It's an archer's term. You've heard pastors say this before. I think I've said it before. But when we look at it, we have to get out of our mind the list of the naughty things, right? And instead realize that sin is the idea that there's something I'm aiming at and that I didn't hit it. Now, Technically, if I'm understanding the scriptures correct, when I get on the target, even if I'm at the edge, but now as I progress in my Christian life, I should be getting closer to the bullseye. Does that make sense? So for me, as a Christian of many years, if I'm not getting closer to the bullseye, maybe hitting the target in general is still sin for me. It's where for that new Christian or somebody who just came back to the faith, for them, that might, it might not be sin. I don't look down on a lot of smokers. For me, regular smoking, having cigarettes every single day, that would be a sin for me. Am I making sense? So that's why I want to get out of the idea of my list of naughty things is sin. No, the word literally means the target, the ideal, the logos that God has for you specifically in your life. Some of those are general. Adultery is sin, right? Murder is sin. Some of those are general, right? And then many of them are very personal, and we've made them rules and laws. And does Jesus like rules and laws that burden people? Fair? Okay, let's go on. Let's get another definition here. That which was from the beginning. What was from the beginning? Oh, 
John is amazing in his idea of this. That which was from the beginning. The first thing you think of is... Isn't that interesting? First thing I think of is nothing. In the beginning, void. But then he goes on to say, he who was in the beginning, right? So there's what was in the beginning, that in the beginning, and the he who was in the beginning. And the big idea I want you to grab from this is that in the beginning there was the originator, the grand idea that works all things into, that works all things into. So if I get this right, when John is saying in the beginning there was the creative one, our Father, right? And that merely by speaking, effortless creation of good. Though it was God's work, was it effort? Though it was God's work, because it said he worked six days and then he... Okay? But was it effort? Spoke and it happened. Doesn't sound too stressful to me until we biffed it and all that kind of stuff, but then the stress came in. But it, all, all that to say that when he's saying that from the beginning, the logos of life, he's talking about God's ability to just speak into our lives and it flows out. Okay? Yes? Off we go. Next definition as I continue down that um, is name and namesake. If I said, oh, you guys know Todd, and some of you know that dude over there is Todd, his name means something different to, than, to you than to the people who've sat down for dinner with him, gone on a run with him, did a project on the house with Todd. Okay? Namesake is the one that's in relationship with and knows the character of. Does that make sense? So, for instance, if I go down to the hardware store and I say, oh, I'm getting this for Dave. He's doing a project at the school. Oh, the people at the hardware store, they know Dave. They're like, this one... It's on us. He brings us so much bit. Making sense? It's the character. It's the person. It's literally referring to the person. It's not the idea of a person. It's the interaction of the person. Namesake. Okay? It's the character and quality. Character and quality or relationality. Okay? Next, Father. Every time I've read this in the passages of John before, I was going back to Jesus' use of the word Abba. Jesus' use of the word Abba. God, uh, God in Christ wants us to look at our Father in Heaven as Daddy, right? The Almighty Creator, that from the beginning that got everything going. Jesus informs us, when you go pray, go pray, Daddy, Papa, loving one who accepts me, okay? John is using a different word there. He's using the word Patir versus Abba. Still translates Father, but it's more meaning... Um, the one who sets things up, the man of the house, the person that's holding things together, the one that tells you to get up off the ground and keep going when it... Does that make sense? Okay, John's using a, diff, a different word, Father. I think they're interrelated. I don't think they're separate. Okay, that was the one part I wanted to impress you with. I, like, I thought that was... Sorry. sorry, I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. Last definition, love of brothers. Depending on the translation you read, some translations will say brothers. Some translations will say brothers and sisters. Some translations will say Christian brothers. Some translations will say Christian brothers and sisters. And I was reading in uh, the New Living, and I love the New Living translation for a lot of different reasons, and I got to Christian's brothers and sisters, and it felt wrong to me. I don't know why. It felt wrong to me. And so I had, to, I had to consider, went back to the Greek, and indeed, it does mean brothers. It means brothers, but it means the relational brother. In other words, Jenny's my brother. In that sense. It's the familial God-created man. At first, it was just man, right? And then it's man and women, right? But in the creation of man, mankind. Am I making sense? Here's the other thing that struck me as wrong. It said Christians, brothers, and sisters. And does Jesus ever tell you to just love the people in the church? And so I had to have some contention with these people who know a lot more about Greek with me, but I don't think they were putting it in context. I think they were making it too easy on us, right? That the love of brothers that you'll read throughout John is about loving the store clerk, your neighbor. Jesus was absolutely clear. You see your enemy broken on the side of the road, that's your neighbor. Go love him. 
You see the person that you're really ticked at and mad at? That's your brother. And if you can't love your... And I'm sorry, women, you're not out of that because it's an inclusive generic term. It's not a gender term. It's not a sex term. Sorry. You're included, brothers. All right? Definition's done. Was that kind of fun? All right, let's wrap this up. I mean, seriously, even just knowing the words, there's some encouragement that goes in that, but I'm not done. I'm going to keep going. Next, the context. I want to give you the context of 1 John. There's a phrase that John repeats left and right. I write so that. He tells us right off the bat, I'm writing so that, right? And then every now and then he says the word, remember, I write so that, remember. I have written, I am writing, I'm going to, I'm writing so that. And so we're going to go through several of the so that's uh, that we have on there. The very first one he says, I write so that our joy may be complete, and that's an inclusive joy. So he is writing so you can have complete joy. And if you're filling in a blank, there's a blank right there that says complete joy. He is writing so that we can have complete joy. That's the whole start. Well, actually, it starts with that which was from the beginning, which we have seen, which we have heard which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life that we've seen, we've heard, we've touched. And we proclaim it to you so that, I write so that, your joy may be complete, right? From that, from the beginning. I write so that you do not sin. I write so that you do not sin, but that you would live right, okay? That's his second theme that goes on in there. The next theme, I write, and here he doesn't say so that, but he says, I write, it's not an old command, but it is an old command. And it's a new command, but it's not a new command, right? He puts these two against each other. In, in other words, the command that I'm giving you is one you've had since the beginning. The very fact of creation was a fact of love. The very fact that God creating something good and created us to be in connection was love. Command from the beginning, right? Not hate. Reminders. And then he gave a reminder. Walk in the light, not in the dark. Walk in the light, not in the dark. Right? Here's the break in the poem. This is where the poem that we're going to read fits in. I want you to have joy. I don't want you to sin. I want you to live right. I want you to remember love because hate's going to make you blind. You're not going to even know where you're going. Stop the hate stuff. And I want you to walk in the light because the dark's going to destroy not only you but the people around you. So get back into the light just like he's in the light. And if you live in the light like he's in the light, then you're going to love your brother. Right? And then we have this poem. How many of you feel you can live up to all these things that are in the first part? <laughs> my hands down. In my classroom when I say, how many of you have ever seen a dog? I'll raise my hand because I've seen a dog. Oh, wait, none of you raised your hand. Oh, good. Two of you back there saw a dog before. Good. We actually have one in here with us. Oh, it's so gorgeous. I love that. I'm going to spend some time with Ozzy afterwards. And so that time I did not because I can't meet up with these. And right in the middle of this list of things that are difficult for us to do, he puts this poem. So cool. Following the poem, remember, obey God, not the world's enticements. Obey God, not the world's enticements. Which is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, wanting to think of yourself as higher than others. Right? And off we go. Take care of, I write because, take care of your body, don't obey it. Now, this one's a little um, obtuse. You might not uh, slip into this, but I, I looked through Barclay a commentary, and he was talking about uh, the beginnings and the, the group that was reading this passage. And the passage actually says, I'm right to you because you know the truth. Anyone who says Jesus did not come in the flesh doesn't know the truth. And I was like, okay, so he's talking about the, the Christhood coming in being incarnate. Well, there was this thing about people saying, oh, the material world's all evil. It's all bad, right? Only the spiritual world is good. Material's evil. Your flesh, it's the most evil. Does Scripture say our flesh is evil? It says the desires of our flesh, right? We're working against the desires. So John was very wont to say, your body's good. Take care of it. 
But then everywhere else he's saying, just don't obey it. <laughs> don't let your body tell you what to do. When your body's kicking an emotion out because of what you ate or because of what somebody else did, don't follow what your body tells you to do. Instead, follow what the Spirit's telling you to do inside or what your values are telling you to do. Am I making sense with that, right? Sometimes we get angry at somebody simply because we haven't eaten and we haven't slept. And if I give in to that anger, I am obeying my, my flesh. My flesh is not evil. It's good. Take care of it. And then, by the way, you won't have as many desires of the flesh if you're taking good care of it, right? And the Adventist, boy, that's our, that's our stick. Eat good. Exercise well. Take care of the vessel that God dwells in, right? Eat good. Exercise well. Get your rest. Um, and off we go. The last one, I write so that believers can have eternal life. Okay? In Christ. And the way it says it uh, in, your, in your fill it out and stuff, believe in Christ for eternal life. Believe in Christ. That's what you would put in the thing there for eternal life. And then we get to our passage. Would you stand with me and read the passage as we go through? Uh, I encourage you to read it out loud if you can uh, see the screen or you can look in 1 John chapter 2, uh, 12 through 14. Let's read together. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God remains in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Father, I ask right now that our hearts would be open to your spirit, and that you would show us the points in our life where your forgiveness is already extended because of your name. I ask that you would show us in our lives those places where we're working hard with all the muster we can might up and that your ideal, the logos in us, is going to come to fruition because we are struggling forward with the strength to uh, really participate in the overcoming of the evil all around us. And that we could rejoice in those places where your spirit has so been established in our life. We have practiced your word, your logo so much, and your love is natural. Walking in the light is natural. That we can celebrate that and give you the glory. Amen. Psychologists would say it this way. Thank you. Yeah, you can be seated or you can stand. I really don't care. Um, <laughs> Uh, psychologists would say uh, that there is unconscious unskilled, meaning you are absolutely unaware that you don't even have the skill and you're really bad if it comes at you, right? So for instance, uh, riding a bike, right? A three-year-old, a five-year-old who's never even seen a bike, they're unconscious that they don't have the skill, right? Or for that person who was raised in a yelling, screaming home, that doesn't even realize that there's another way to live besides yelling and screaming. They are unconscious that there's a skill of kindness that they could learn. Yes? Following? They say the next step in growth is that you become conscious that you stink at that, right? <laughs> you become conscious of your unskilled nature. You become conscious of your unskilled nature. Then they say you become conscious as you are practicing the skill. Think of a piano player. Or a struggling piano player. A lot of people listen to it and they go, oh, that's beautiful. And then one day somebody wakes up, like a friend I teach with, who at the age of 47 said, oh, I think I'd like to learn how to play. They just became conscious that they were unskilled. Before they were unconscious that they were unskilled because they didn't care everybody else could play. Now they kind of wanted to participate. They thought that looked good. So they started lessons. And then they became conscious of how unskilled they were, <laughs> right? They've been practicing, their skills are building, now they're conscious and they're skilled, it takes a lot of work. And then there's Greg. Greg sits down, he doesn't have to do a lot of thinking to do the magic he does up there, right? Doesn't have to think a lot, right? He is unconscious and yet skilled. It has become natural, it has become habitual, right? Another way to look at it is you don't even know you don't know, right? You're working to know, and now you know, but it's not natural, it's a struggle. 
How many of you can picture some parts in your life that fit into each of these categories? Can we take two minutes? I don't want to take too long, but on the back of your sheet, I've actually parceled them out because this is where I think, um, I think John is talking about our spiritual life and how we love the world, right? But I think he's also giving us some secrets that could help with those parts of our life that um, the daily mundaneness, your cooking stinks. And you now know it because your family finally got honest with you, right? Okay. Uh, your cooking's improving, but man, it takes a lot of work, right? Uh, the way you talk to your spouse is slightly belittling. And you can see it on your children's face, right? Versus you're working to compliment them, but it's effort. You got to think about picking up those flowers, right? So what you have here on the back, and could you please just... And, in case somebody's looking over your shoulder and spying on you, maybe don't write it in code so nobody knows. Or just be honest and we can be a, a transparent group of people. Maybe that's a better idea. Struggling novice. What is something you are aware you do not do well? If you want to take that into what John's talking about in your spiritual life, I encourage you to do that. What is something that currently in your spiritual life you know you're missing the mark? You need to move closer to the bullseye. You have no skill in it, and you don't even know how to get there. Would you write that under struggling novice? Two, three words. Something that you, brings it to your mind. Courageous champion. The young person who is strong. They have the ideal. The logos abides in you. The logos, the idea of God, the word of God, the best idea that's out there is in you, and the evil's overcome, and you're moving towards it. You're struggling towards it, right? Courageous champion. What's an area in your life that, man, you're grabbing the bull by the horns and you're working on it? Twice a week, three times a week, you're sitting down and you're thinking through, okay, I biffed it again on Tuesday. Oh, I'm going to overcome tomorrow when I... What's that area in your life? If you don't have one, find one. That's me preaching right now. That's me admonishing. That's me going into the like, you better make sure, right? You know, with the whole cheeks, cheeks shaking and stuff, right? If you don't have an area that you're pressing on to grow in and get better at, find one. And last, can you have the courage to admit that God has brought you far enough in the spiritual life that there are some things that you do naturally now that you didn't used to? That Jesus so dwells in you and moves through you that you've become the serene doyen. Doyen is master of the craft. Doyen is the person who, when he thinks of welding a tree for the kids at Christmas at Riverside Christian, he puts some pieces of metal together and grabs out the welding kit and, oh, I don't know, it doesn't look like much to me. It took me a while to think of it and everybody else is going, whoa, dude, Dave, you're amazing, right? What is that thing that's become natural? It's no longer a struggle. You look at your children and you just go, oh, gosh, I love them. Some parents, it takes a while to get there. I shouldn't be that honest up front, should I? Is that okay? That's, uh, okay, it's okay, okay. Just put three, five words down. And then let's go see what John has to say. Let's see what John has to say. Let's go back to the scripture. The novice, I'm writing to you, little children, by the way, when you read John, uh, some of you already know, does John mean actual little kids here? All through the whole book, he, is, he calls them all his little children. What he's saying is, those of you that I've helped come to know Jesus, right? Hello, my little brothers and sisters, right? There's sometimes, Susie, uh, take this the right way, but there's sometimes when Susie talks to me, Susie has this look and this feel about her that I just feel like she's saying, oh, you're so precious, Eric, right? And I'm, I'm actually older than her. How dare she talk? No, but I just feel like, oh, yeah. I feel, uh, you have that endearing sense of, oh, my little kid. Yes? Okay. That's what he means there. By the way, the second one, he doesn't. He does mean little kids. But in this one, he's talking to us, everybody. Little children, your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know because you know who was from the... What did we learn about that? Mm, interesting. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. Past tense or present tense? 
past tense. Hmm. I have written to you, children, present tense or past tense. Hmm. So he's telling you this, that you're forgiven, and he's telling you, I've already told you, right? Interesting. Because you know the Father. That word know means experience. It means to interact experientially. I've written to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. By the way, that's the only one that didn't change. It's the only one that didn't change. The space where you're the serene doyen. You've known him, from the be- him who is from the beginning. I've written to you young men because you're strong. Big change. The word of God remains in you. The logos, the idea of God, dwells in you, abides in you, sticks around you. It's constantly in front of your eyes. The ideal you're shooting for. And you have overcome the evil one. My daughter was learning to ride a bike. Actually, she wasn't learning yet. Uh, And both of my children didn't want to learn quite as early as some of the kids around them and stuff. And so we got my daughter a bike, and it had the cute little tassels going off and stuff. And I tried the way I had seen every other father to uh, to teach their child how to ride the side thing, right? Or holding by the seat, and then was not working. This was a struggle. There's two struggles going on here. We were both novices. I was a novice at teaching bike riding and my daughter was a novice at learning how to ride the bike. So we went up to a uh, a park where there was more room to crash and not actually hit things, just fall off. And uh, I tried a new method. It was kind of interesting. I think if uh, somebody on America's Funniest Videos had taken it, I might have won some cash. But anyway, I went to the front and I held on to the handlebars. And then I started running backwards, right? I don't know why I just did that on camera, but that's what I was doing out there, right? It's like... (laughs) That's what I was doing out there. And as she got better, and I didn't need to hold on, I'd just tap. I was just tapping the wheels, tapping the wheels. And all of a sudden it's like, whoosh, I stepped aside and boom, off she went. And then she fell, right? What was my job once she fell off? Abba or Pater? Some disagreements. Abba is Daddy, right? If I had just done Daddy instead of let's get back on Pater, would she have ever learned to read the bike? The memory in her head would have been the scab versus the success. Am I making some sense? Am I making some sense? So in the area that she was struggling, she was forgiven. Oh, you fell. No problem. No big deal. Let's try again. You got this. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll hold on tighter. You won't let go. I won't let go until you tell me to. You get in the picture? Right? Get in the picture? Okay. And off we go again. I'm tapping. I'm tapping. I got it, Dad. I got it. Do you? Do you? Do you? Go. Woo! Like twice. Literally twice. Right? So as a novice, what did she need from me to grow in the area that she wasn't good at, that she was unskilled? The forgiveness, it's okay. And the, you know the father. You know the pater. You know the generator. Get back on. Am I making sense? When you turn your page back over and you look at the area that you know you're unskilled in, that area where you're the novice, have you forgiven yourself for failing and failing and failing? Can I be honest with you? It doesn't matter if you've forgiven yourself. It's not what the passage says. Forgive yourself. The passage says you're already forgiven on account of... You remember? on account of his name, on account of Jesus' name. And if we know the name of the person, am I making sense? If you know Jesus Christ and how he accepts us who have sinned, that novice isn't going to last too long, is it? It's really not in the journey of that. You've already been forgiven because of Jesus' name. And you know the Father who's right there with you, tapping on the handlebars where you're trying to figure it out. Now we go to the courageous champions. This is an area that I do really well on 75% of the time. Don't talk to me about the last three weeks. I, uh, I firmly believe that if my body is in shape and I'm taking care of it, I can be more connected to God. 
and uh, science is saying the same thing, that the way we're wired, if I am eating junk, my brain will fire differently, my body will respond differently, my hormones are going to go off, and my ability to stay focused or kind is going to be depleted. If I'm not exercising, if I'm not taking my walks, my body will suffer. And if I am in that state of suffering, right, this is a place I do pretty good at, though. I know how to exercise. I know how to eat. I know how to... The logos, the idea, is something I keep in front of my head. And as soon as I forget the idea, the logos, guess what starts to happen? I jump back into my novice land for just a little bit. And in the middle of the novice land, for some reason, there's this... I don't know if I'm making any sense. I feel like I'm not making sense. I'm going to just keep talking, and you raise a hand if it's like, I get it. Okay, nobody's raised their hand yet, so I know... Oh, one got it. Okay, one got it. Um, as soon as I go back to my novice state, uh, there is this point where I realize, oh, I've lost 10 pounds before. You have overcome the evil one. Oh, I've exercised three, four times a week before. You've done that before. Oh, you got back on the bike before. Oh, you took a corner before. Oh, you just fell. Hey, but you have already overcome. You have. You've done it before. And as soon as I think that I was able to do that before, in my brain I go, oh, that's right. The ideal is, the logos, the idea of God, planted within me so I can become more like Christ. Am I making sense? Okay? Nobody's raising their hand, so I don't feel like I've made sense yet. Yeah, I feel like I, I'm still losing you. Now that I remember I've overcome in the past, that it's already taken care of, the ideal comes to my brain easier, and I have the strength. Where's my strength come from? From the abiding word. What is that word? The word is the logos of God planted within me that's pointing me in the direction so I can become more like Christ. Okay? Can I get off this one? Yes? Okay, off we go. Courageous champion. Can you think of that area right now? Are you in the success mode of your courageous champion, strong young man or woman? You know what I mean. It's the non-gender specific. Thank you very much. Or are you in the, whoops, I slipped back to novice, but I'm going to struggle on, right? The last one, the serene doyen, right? This is the one where you have practiced so much, all of a sudden you realize you just did it without even thinking. I've had a couple of these moments in the classroom where uh, rascals in the class are very tough. If you've ever taught Sunday school or a class or maybe even tried to teach uh, a family member something and they're not getting it or they're actually just being obtuse, you know, they're just being like, I don't want to, right? <clears throat> well, I started to realize that reaction was who? Oh, shoot. So I had to start to work on they were being little twerps, but I had to work on, so I started working on me, and I went all champion on it, you know? I'm all like, okay, they're a precious child of God. They might not even know God, but I'm, in my read of Scripture, in my take, in my faith, for me, and you can disagree, that's okay, but in my take, even if they have not submitted their life to God, they're still God's child. God created them too, and I've been called to love them. So, all of a sudden, I'm struggling to love them. Oh, Jimmy! Yeah, that's a good point. It's not for now. Could you just step outside? Ah, ah. And then all of a sudden, one day, oh yeah, that's just not going to work, Jimmy. Sorry, right now, it's not the time. If you need to step outside, that's okay. And I turned and I realized, oh, that came naturally. I didn't even realize it. Is that because I'm so good and I work so hard? It's because of the grace of God. Through the struggle... He has allowed me to be the father situation who has known him who is from the beginning. Who is that that was from the beginning? It was the one that simply by a word creates good without effort. All of a sudden in my life, I had the word, the idea, and it was created in my life without effort. That is not me. But he puts me in the father or the doyen section. I hope this is encouraging. I hope you hear what I'm saying. I'd like you to softly read through this passage again. And as we do, I want you to think of your little child section, your novice area. I want you to think of your champion area, the young men, young woman, fighting forward, you've already succeeded area. And I want to think of that area that God has blessed you in helping it become natural. God breathed ease of creation for the good. Can we do that together?
Let's read. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God remains in you. And you have overcome the evil one. When you find yourself in, a, in these sit, situations, when you find yourself in the beginning stage, remember you're forgiven because of him, not because of you. You don't even, you can't, I hope you receive the forgiveness, but it's already happened. And you've experienced the Father's guiding hand. When you're in that champion stage, I hope you remember that you are strong. You've already succeeded in the past, and it can happen again. But you have to keep that idea, the logos, God's provisional word in front of you, the vision of where you're headed. And in those times where you experience the creative act of God in your life, and it's natural, give praise. Turn and give praise. His point is, his desire in the book is that you have complete joy, not sinning, that you live into the command, live into the light, that you're not blind because of your hate, that you know God and you love God and you obey God, not the world's enticement, that you know your flesh is actually not bad, God created it good, but stop listening to it and just take care of it. And then believe in Christ who has brought you into eternal life that you can experience today uh, experience today and when we awake again for eternity and do that by remembering your state your state is forgiven do that by remembering your abiding power is the logos the idea and that the evil's conquered it's already done and do that by remembering that you are deeply intimately in a loving connected relationship with God our Father in heaven who makes all things good simply by speaking without strain. Father, thank you. Uh, and uh, every time you give me the opportunity to share what I've been studying with others, you speak it deeper into my life. And I pray that uh, we as a fellowship would dive in to the frequent reminder that daily we would come to your word, come to your presence, and that you would speak over us again and just renew and renew. And I pray you'd even give us courage. God, I am, uh, I'm, I'm suspicious that you have given a word to some people in here for somebody else in their life, a word of encouragement, a word of forgiveness, a word of strengthening, a word of lifting up. And I pray that as they speak that into the lives of the people around them, that it would nourish their soul again. Simply the act of them speaking out would nourish themselves. Thank you so much for how you minister to our hearts. Amen.